you, church. It's a privilege to be able to spend this Sunday morning celebrating Easter with you and your family in your home. And while this Sunday may look different than previous years where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, the truth is we still have much to celebrate. Jesus has still defeated death. He's still removed the sting of sin. He's still seated on the throne, and he is still saving people even this day. And so we as a church and we as the church scattered across the Northwest, around the nation, and around the world are celebrating the gift of salvation that comes through Jesus' victory over the grave. And I hope you this morning can be reminded of that truth as we study God's Word. Before we jump into our study, just want to make you aware of a couple things. One, we continue to try and update the website www.summitlifeseattle.com with some resources that would equip you uh, to navigate the world that you find yourselves in. For families, uh, we are providing each week just uh, some updates uh, for you to have some special teaching time with your kids uh, should you choose. We also have some teaching on there with live links that would just better equip you as a parent to disciple your kids to know God's word, to grow in obedience to God's word, and to be equipped to one day go where God would lead them uh, with the gospel. Additionally, there's some marriage enrichment links on there, and then some daily checkups that uh, tune you into some leading voices, Christian voices in our world today. So voices like Al Mohler as, as he does the daily briefing, voices like John Piper who uh, has some daily devotionals. And so we just want to continue to equip you as you navigate the world that you find yourself in. Additionally, we also, through the generosity of one of our families, have been able to make right now media available to you at no cost. Uh, it's an incredible resource. It's an incredible platform with all kinds of teaching and content that you can explore for not only days, not only weeks, but you really could explore four months to teaching on, on parenting, teaching on marriage, teaching on discipleship, teaching on theology. And for you parents who are trying to figure out what to do with your kids, uh, there's even kids videos, kids content on there that they can explore that would be edifying to their soul. And so we're incredibly thankful uh, for this gift and excited to be able to make this available to each of you. Many of you have already uh, subscribed, logged in, and, and are already uh, working through the material. I've gotten texts and emails from a number of you just saying how encouraged you are by this stuff. Uh, please know the email that you got from me for Right Now Media is not spam. It's not trash. I'll resend it this week and as you get it again fresh in your inbox, I'd encourage you to take time uh, to set that up so that you can be enriched by this resource. And then finally, I, as your pastor, am praying for wisdom. I'm asking others to pray uh, on my behalf uh, so that I might have wisdom. Wisdom on how to love you well. Uh, we care about you, our church, and we love you, our church, and we want to continue to love you well uh, during this time. We also are praying that God would give us wisdom on, on how to serve our community well and asking God to give me wisdom on how to lead our church well during this unique season. One of the things that I was made aware of this week is that the Issaquah Food Bank is in need of some drivers who would be willing to sign up for some time slots to deliver the food to some families who are in need. They have the food, they have the families, they just need to connect those two things uh, through some drivers. And it seems like a really meaningful way for us to serve our community, a way that we can fit it into our schedules, time slots where we can uh, just uh, plug, plug our name in and, and serve for a uh, period of time that, that we're available to serve, whether it's individuals or couples. They have gloves, they have masks that they're going to provide for you. And so we're going to make that link available uh, to you as well so that you can be a part of our church stepping in to serve our community. And, and as we navigate this season, we're reminded that the resurrection hope meets us right where we are at. Our world uh, may be spinning, but Jesus is still ruling. And we can have hope this morning as we turn our attention to God's word. And so please join me as I pray for our study uh, as we prepare to step into Luke chapter 24. Let's pray together. Father, we are thankful for the victory of the cross. We're thankful for the empty tomb. We're thankful for the salvation that comes through faith alone and Christ alone because of your rich grace alone. And God, I pray that across our region, nation, and world today that the refrain of the saints would be, he is risen, he is risen indeed. And that they would be reminded, that we would be reminded that there is a resurrection hope that each of us shares because of the gift of salvation through Jesus. God, we also pray that as the testimonies of the saints scatter across social media, as the testimony of the saints 
uh, scatter within their workplace and neighborhood and home. Father, that many more would come to know this resurrection hope this Easter. Lord, we pray that you would use your word in our life to shape us this morning. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. This morning as we turn to Luke chapter 24, we're going to be reminded that there is a battle against unbelief that each one of us face. This battle of unbelief does not mean that people do not believe in anything, but rather that they've found something substitutionary to place their belief in. All of us, regardless of who we are, place our belief in in someone or something. People don't say, I don't believe that because they don't believe anything, but they say, I don't believe that because there's something else that they believe more than what you're claiming. And as we come to the resurrection narrative, as we look at Luke chapter 24, looking at verses <clears throat> one through 35, we're gonna see that there are all kinds of responses to Jesus. In fact, there are four responses in the text that we're going to see this morning, responses to Jesus. We're going to see the response of confusion. We're going to see the response of skepticism or disbelief. We're going to see the response of dis indifference. And we're going to see each of these responses, whether it's confusion or skepticism or indifference, confronted with the resurrection Savior and each person or people group coming to faith in Jesus. You see, at the crux of this passage, at the crux of Scripture, at the crux of the gospel and the resurrection narrative is, is this question, what do you believe? Question that we all have to ask ourselves at some point. What is it that I believe? And the refrain th throughout the centuries of the church has been that we believe in a resurrected Savior that we believe in the hope of the gospel, that we believe that Jesus Christ has conquered death and extended life to those who would believe, and that we believe that Jesus is coming back one day. Let's watch this video reminding us of the belief that has echoed through the centuries. Let's watch. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. message replaces the old belief system of death with a new message of life found through faith in Jesus. And while we come to this text with four different responses, it's my conviction and belief that God wants each of us to know the resurrected Savior. We look at Luke chapter 24 and we see the first response found on this first 
uh, encounter with the empty tomb. Let's read Luke chapter 24, picking up in verse 1. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces and to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hand of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day he would rise again. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. The first encounter with the empty tomb is, is those who would confront the resurrection story with, with a confusion. In fact, there are those who will be puzzled by the resurrection story. I come to this text, and, and we see in verse 4 that these uh, disciples who were coming to the tomb to prepare the body of Jesus, the final preparations of, of burial, they, they come to Jesus and they're perplexed or puzzled. This word literally means to be at a loss, to have no way out, to, to not understand what's going on around them. You see, they, they expected to arrive to the scene and find two guards who were guarding the tomb. They expected to see the stone covering the tomb with a seal. They expected to step into the tomb and, and see a body still laying there that had been half prepared for burial. You see, what had happened is on Good Friday when Jesus had died, they had begun the burial preparations for Jesus, but the Sabbath crept into the preparations. And so they, they honored the Sabbath by keeping it holy, the day of rest. And so they, they stopped preparations for all of Saturday. And they're coming back early Sunday morning to finish these preparations. And as they come back to the tomb, they're met with a, a situation that's far different than what they expected. Rather than two guards, they see two men in dazzling apparel. As we look at the other gospels, we would know that those are angels, two angels that would meet them. And rather than seeing the, the, the tomb door shut by the stone, the, the stone's been rolled away. Rather than leaning into the tomb and seeing the body, there's, there's no body to be found. And, and the text says that they're perplexed, they're puzzled. They're at a loss. In fact, they, they feel like there's, there's, there's no way to put these pieces uh, together to, to make sense. It's, it's incredibly disorienting for them. It's like a riddle uh, where you don't know the answer to. And so they're seeing all these pieces and, and just can't make sense of it. When I was a kid, my family used to tell riddles that would perplex me, that would puzzle me. And, and for moments, sometimes minutes and sometimes days, I would think on these riddles, trying to come up with the answer on my own. And when I was at my most stubborn state, I would spend days thinking on these riddles, trying to figure out the answers because I was so perplexed. I was at a loss. I couldn't figure out how to put these pieces together. One of the riddles that my parents shared with me was there was this man who was in a concrete room. The room was so thick that he couldn't break his way through the walls. And all that there was in the room was a mirror and a table. And the question was, how does he get out of the room? And as, as moments turned into minutes and minutes turned into days for me, I finally gave up and I said, I, like, there's no answer to this. I'm, I'm at a loss. There's, there's no way that you could put these random pieces together and come up with some sort of solution or some sort of clarity. And, and yet they told me the man who's in the room looks into the mirror. He sees what he saw. He grabbed the saw took the table, he cut it in half, two halves make a hole, and he crawled out the hole. And you wonder why I was perplexed. That's, that's what's happening in, in, in this moment. There was this moment of not understanding what was going on. They, they were puzzled by the resurrection story. They, they, they didn't have their bearings. They couldn't figure out which way was up and how to make sense of the situation around them. And that's the truth for many of us in life is that we can't make sense oftentimes of, of the many pieces in our life. Many people right now feel incredibly confused by the world that they find themselves in. And as we've been stuck at home and as my wife loves puzzles, not the 12-piece the puzzles, but like the 1,500-piece puzzles, I'm, I'm constantly coached and reminded that you got to find the edges first. 
you got to find the edges first. That the edges are what bring an orientation to make sense of all the other pieces in the puzzle. And, and similarly for us, the gospel is the cornerstone that helps make sense of everything else around us. But here's, here's the truth. Puzzles can be confusing, but they can also be solved. All you need is a change of perspective. If we look at verses 5 through 9, we see that these two men say to uh, these ladies, they say, why do you seek for the living among the dead? Okay, all, all of a sudden they're beginning to see some clarity. That's why the body's not there, because Jesus may not be dead. And then they began to remind them. Say, he, he is risen. Remember how he told you that he would be delivered into the hands of simple men and be crucified and on the third day that he would rise? And then they began to remember these things, making sense of a world that seemed so puzzling or disorienting or, or confusing. All of a sudden, the confusion was met by the resurrected Savior. It was the gospel that allowed them to interpret the world around them. And the same is true for you and me. The same is true for those in our world today, that, that many people are puzzled by the resurrection story. Many people are, are puzzled by the world that they find themselves in. But once we settle the gospel in our life, it allows us to rightfully orient and interpret the world around us. <clears throat> You say, what is, what is the gospel? What is this cornerstone that allows me to interpret this confusing world around me? We, we in our church oftentimes talk of three circles. The first circle being God's design. And when we think through the gospel, we think through the fact that God has a design for our lives. And that God's design for our life has uh, been distorted by sin. That we no longer can see God's design perfectly because of the sin that would corrupt our thinking and corrupt our sight and corrupt our lives. Sin, sins that we would commit and sins that just, of just things that we don't do because we don't know what to do. O omission, sins of commission, sins of omission. And sin would, would move us from this, this one circle of God's design to this other circle of, of living in a state of brokenness. And, and we don't have to look far to, to see the brokenness around us. Oftentimes people ask me, why, why is it that there are natural disasters? And, and not, not to, to, to be patronizing, but, but because of sin. Galatians, or Genesis chapter 3, we see that God, not only was there a curse among man, but there was a curse on creation. That God cursed the ground beneath them. And, and that creation, as scripture would say in Romans, is, is groaning and longing and waiting for the day of redemption. So why are there earthquakes? Why are there tornadoes? Why are there tsunamis? Because all of creation is groaning and waiting for that day of redemption. The, dis, the God's design has been distorted by sin. Why do we hurt people uh, through intention or, or unintentionally? Be because of sin in our life. We live in this state of brokenness. And, and should the message end there, it would be a defeating and discouraging message. And, and yet, when we consider the gospel, God's design and the brokenness of man, we see that the gospel is Jesus who has made a way to restore God's design. How does he do that? When we live in the state of brokenness, it's, it's through faith and repentance in Jesus, his work on our behalf, that God begins to reclaim and restore his design in our life. And so all of a sudden, a world that seems so disorienting, a world that would puzzle us, all of a sudden begins to make sense as God's design begins to, to be reestablished in our hearts and in our lives and in our homes. And that's the truth that, that these ladies were met with on that first Resurrection Sunday. That their confusion, that their uh, minds being perplexed, that their, their puzzled uh, nature of trying to figure out what was going on was met with belief through faith in Jesus. We move forward in the story, verse 10, we see Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the eleven told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in, and he saw the linen clothes by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. So these women <laughs> recall the things that Jesus had told them. They hear the message that he's not here, but he's risen. And then they go tell the 11 and they tell the apostles that Jesus has defeated death. And as they come to the disciples, all but one of the disciples 
discredit the story. See, there are those in this world who are puzzled by the resurrection story, but there are also those who will discredit the resurrection story. This word idle tale, the word idle means nonsensical. It's, it's nonsense. Tale, talking about a fictitious story, like much like a fisherman would go fishing and come home with like a 10-foot bass, right? Like, like that's just an idle tale. It's a, it's a nonsensical, fictitious story that has no merit and truth in it. And that was the response that, that these, uh, most of these disciples had, was to discredit the testimony of, of these women, all but one. You see, here's, here's the truth about stories. Stories can be validated by an examination of the evidence. Stories can be validated by an examination of the evidence. All but one discredited, but one stood up, ran to the tomb, and began to examine the evidence. In fact, the text would say that he stooped and looked in, so he looked in, and then he saw. The Greek word here means not only did he see with his eyes, but he perceived, he discerned, he understood what had happened. Looking around him, he began to understand that Jesus was no longer dead, but he had defeated death. And when he went home, he marveled at what had happened. Stories can be validated through an examination of the evidence. Dr. Gary Habermas has spent his life examining the evidence around the resurrection. And there are all kinds of historical evidences that would surround the resurrection. But he, in his book, A Case for the Resurrection, talks about a minimal facts approach, four plus one, uh, speaking of the, the facts that surround the resurrection of Jesus, that we should just uh, be confident in the hist historicity of, of these things, the historical fact of these things, four plus one, the, the minimal facts approach. Here, here are the four plus one facts. First one is this, that there was a death by crucifixion, that Jesus really died by crucifixion. This isn't only recorded in scripture, but it's recorded by Josephus, it's recorded by Tychitus, it's recorded by Lucian, it's, it's recorded in the Talmud. That biblical, extra-biblical texts would all speak of a crucifixion that Jesus experienced. Why is this important? Because Romans were experts at killing people. The, the cross was an instrument of execution and death. And as we look at the historicity of Jesus dying on the cross, we can walk away with uh, all but certainty that Jesus really died on the cross. There are all kinds of, of theories that would try to, to undermine this testimony, and yet history would speak loud and clear that Jesus really died on the cross. That's the first fact. The second fact is this, that the disciples really believed in the resurrection. The disciples of Jesus really believed in the resurrection. They claimed it. They, in fact, not only claimed it, but they, they put everything on, on that truth. In fact, Paul would be so adamant about the resurrection that he said, he said if, if there is no resurrection, then we should be pitied among all other people. The message of Christianity is not moralism. It is a testimony of Jesus defeating death, living the perfect life that you and I could not live so that through faith in him, we might be called sons and daughters of the most high God. And for these disciples, they claimed the resurrection of Jesus. And not only did they claim it, they believed the resurrection of Jesus. Seven ancient sources attest to the disciples' willingness to suffer and die for this claim. And you say there are a lot of people around the world who are willing to die for things that aren't true. Uh, here's, here's what I'd like to argue there's a, there's a difference. The first difference is this. These are not people who are naturally courageous. Like if you look at the story of the disciples, they're just not naturally courageous people. You see them on the boat, and a storm comes in, they're panicked. They gotta wake up Jesus. Come to the, the crucifixion of Jesus. John speaks of it. After the crucifixion of Jesus, what do they do? They, they run and they lock the doors for fear of what others might do to them. They were afraid. They were not naturally courageous. And yet something changed that prompted a courage that was unwavering, even to the point of suffering and death. The second is this, that, that their testimony of the resurrection, their faith in Jesus, who had conquered death, had, had assured them of their salvation. And so by their death, there was nothing uh, more that they could attain because the, the achievement had already been accomplished by Jesus. 
and all these other faiths where people are willing to, to die for things. It's, it's so they might attain something, and yet we read scripture and we see that Christ's achievement is the means by which we attain salvation, not our, not our work, but his work. The disciples believed in the resurrection. Third, the conversion of Paul, the persecutor of the church. He was hostile towards Christianity. He hated Christians. Paul did not like anything about the resurrection or the testimony of the resurrection until he claimed he met the resurrected Savior. He was hostile towards Christianity and then he became willing to suffer and die for the Christian testimony. This is well recorded in the New Testament. It's recorded by Luke, it's recorded by Paul. It's, it's recorded outside of scripture. Clement of Rome, Polycarp, Tertullian, all would speak of, of Paul's willingness to suffer and die for the Christian faith. Uh, fourth, so four plus one, fourth uh, fact is a conversion of Jesus' half-brother, James, who was a skeptic. So we see the cowards uh, come to faith in Jesus. We see the hostile Paul come to faith in Jesus. Now we see the skeptic, James, the half-brother of Jesus, come to faith in Jesus. As he examines the evidence of the resurrection and comes to know that his half-brother Jesus had defeated death, he becomes a leader in the early church. He would eventually die a martyr's death, and it would be recorded by Josephus and Clement of Alexandria. We see death by crucifixion, disciples' belief in the resurrection, conversion of Paul, and the conversion of the skeptic James. And then the fifth one, the four plus one, the fifth one is the tomb's empty. Tomb's empty. There were all kinds of people who would oppose the testimony of the resurrection of Jesus. Those in, in authority in Rome had every reason to just go to the tomb, present the body, and say, he's still dead. It would have, it would have stopped everything right there because the testimony of Jesus' resurrection didn't begin in surrounding regions, regions, but it began in Jerusalem. And as it began in Jerusalem, the Roman authorities had every opportunity to go present the body of Jesus to just stop this testimony. The religious leaders had every opportunity to bring the following to the tomb and say, see, the stone's still sealed. It's still there. Jesus' body's still there. And yet no one could do such a thing because the body wasn't there. And so for histories, all historians would claim that the tomb is empty and the Christian claim is that the tomb is empty because God, through his son Jesus, defeated death so that you and I might live. You see, there are those who would undermine and discredit the story, but stories can be validated through the examination of the evidence. The, th the third response, and I'm not gonna read this, this whole narrative to you, but the third response is there are those who are too busy for the resurrection story. Not only those who are puzzled by it, confused, not only those who would discredit it, but, but there are those who are just simply indifferent towards it. They're, they're too busy for it. And as we continue in the story, there's, there's two who are going back to uh, their hometown, Emmaus. And as they're traveling back to Emmaus, they're discussing all the things that had happened on Holy Week. Remember last week, we celebrated Palm Sunday, and Jesus then on Monday goes into the temple and and cleanses out the temple, and, and throughout the week he would prophesy and speak of, of his death, and he would speak of his second return. We would, we would see these events surrounding the Passover where the disciples would prepare for Passover on Thursday, and Jesus would then go to the Garden of Gethsemane and be betrayed by Judas and then die on, on Good Friday. And, and they're going home after this Passover event, back to their home, seven miles away in Emmaus, and they're discussing all these things that had happened. They're, they're preoccupied with their own thoughts about all that had happened. And as they're discussing these things, Jesus <laughs> meets them on this road. Verse 16, their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And Jesus said, what, is, what conversation are you holding with each other as you walk? And so they begin to explain to him what they were talking about. And Jesus begins to teach them from the Old Testament how he's the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. He begins to teach them from the Old Testament. We, you, we get down to verse 28, and they're drawing near to the village where they were traveling to. They're drawing near to Emmaus, seven miles away from Jerusalem. 
And, and Jesus acted as if he was going to go further. In verse 29, But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it's towards evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And when he, Jesus, was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. Verse 32, And they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road? while he opened to us the scriptures. And they rose that same hour. They went back to Jerusalem, seven miles back to Jerusalem. They just traveled from Jerusalem all the way to Emmaus. They sit down with Jesus. They're like, we gotta get back to Jerusalem, right? That's where the testimony of the resurrection of Jesus is beginning. So they go all the way back to Jerusalem. Verse 33, they found the 11 and those who were with them gathered. And they said this, the Lord has risen indeed. Verse uh, 6 of chapter 24, we see the angel say he's not here, he is risen. And we see the saints echo in verse 34, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Jesus silenced their busyness with his words. See, they were commentatively speculating on all the things that had happened but commentative speculation is not equal to nor greater than God's revelation. And it's in this moment that those who are too busy with their own agenda are met with the resurrected Savior and everything begins to make sense and they come to faith in Jesus. It's not just those who are confused. It's not just those who would be skeptical. It's not just those who are too busy, but Jesus would meet each one of those people where they were at, revealing himself as the one who has defeated death and extended life to anyone who believed. And, and the refrain of, of the saints throughout the centuries has, has echoed this statement, he is risen, and the church would respond, he is risen indeed. Let's listen to this refrain as it echoes not only through the generations, but it echoes through our church today. Let's listen. Hi, church family. Happy Easter. We have a message for you. He, he is risen. And uh, only to is he's literally living out the Easter Easter message. He's going to be rising soon as well. So love you all. Bye. He is risen. He is risen, he is risen indeed. He, he is, is risen. risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He, he is risen. risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. He has risen. He has risen. He is risen, risen indeed. indeed. He, he is, is risen. risen. He has risen indeed. Fourth and final response to the resurrection story is faith in Jesus. There are those who will believe the story and find life. See, the old message of death with the final words being held by death, have been replaced with Jesus, the Lord of life. And we can find this life through faith in Jesus by admitting our sins. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins, all of our unrighteousness. We admit our sins. We believe in Jesus is the second step. John 3, 16 says, God loved the world that gave his only begotten son that, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. We place our belief in Jesus and then finally we confess Jesus as Lord. Romans 10, 10 and say that we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that, that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead. We will be saved. And if you haven't done that, I would invite you this Easter to make this year the year where you come to know the resurrection life and hope that is found through Jesus. And if, and if you've done that, let me remind you that this is a hope that is unshakable. This is a hope that meets you in the midst of your confusion. This is a hope that anchors you in the midst of, of your skepticism. This is a hope that would silence the busyness of the world around you. This is a hope that will prevail in all things. See, as you in the quietness of your home have opportunity to reflect on uh, this text and consider what it means to know the resurrection hope to allow disbelief to be replaced with belief in Jesus. I, I would encourage you to think through these questions in the quietness of your home or, or amongst your family. The first is this, four plus one, the, the minimal facts approach. 
Which, which of these evidences do you find most compelling? See, I, I've spent my life just committed to studying. I'm, I'm a student of life. I'm a student of, of ministry. And I'm just constantly uh, conf confronting any skepticism in, in my own heart, searching for you know, the quote-unquote evidences of, of, of the story. And I, I love just these truths that I can examine, and, and there's certainly some that are just incredibly compelling. Which, which do you find most compelling? Second question for you to think through is, which of the four responses to the resurrection story best describes you? Which of the four responses to the resurrection story best describes you? Are you puzzled? Are you skeptical? Are you, are you just too busy? Are you one who has belief in Jesus? Third question to think through. Is have you exchanged the old message of death with the new message of life that is found in Jesus? Have you exchanged the old message of death where death has the final say with the new message of life that comes through faith in Jesus? If you haven't, my question is, what's stopping you from doing that today? And if you have, who can you share your story with this week? Let's pray. God, we are thankful. We're thankful for a hope that prevails. We're thankful for the promises of your word. We're thankful that you're a God who's been victorious over the grave. We're thankful that we, like Paul could say in 1 Corinthians 15, O death, where's your victory? O death, where's your sting? For the, for the sting of death has been removed by Jesus, which is sin. God, I pray that you would meet us where we're at and that you would meet us with, with the resurrection hope that's found in Jesus. God, would you bless your church this morning? Would you draw more people into that number as they put their faith in you? We ask these things in your name. Amen. Please know that I'm praying for you and your family, uh, that I'm here for you. If there's anything you need, please don't hesitate to reach out. I've been giving you my cell phone number, a uh, direct line to me. Uh, you can call me, text me anytime, area code 208-695-0260, uh, so that we can uh, share in, in the burden of life that, that you may find yourself in. I uh, count a privilege, uh, serve as your pastor, and looking forward to the day where we'll be able to gather and celebrate this truth in person again. God bless. There is power.